Is it too soon to call Brett Beatty a bust? We'll discuss that on today's edition. Locked on Mets. You are locked on Mets. Your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello to all you uh, Mays and Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on Twitter, Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get 200 of bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Now, Brett Beatty was supposed to be the best third baseman the New York Mets have had since David Wright. That was the billing he was getting coming into the season. I was as high on Brett Beatty as I was on any Mets prospect. I was so bold to rank him over Francisco Alvarez heading into the season as the top prospect in the Mets system. And the reason I thought for making that ranking was because I just didn't think the floor was that low for Brett Beatty. I thought the floor was just very high. He had answered some of the questions at third base. He looked great in spring training defensively and, and had really shown an effort that he put into that in the offseason. He was coming off a amazing 2022 campaign. Here's a guy that took every single note that you could have had when he made it up to double A in 2021. And, you know, didn't play bad, but certainly struggled more than he did when he was in high A and thriving in 2021. You you saw the really high ground ball rate. It was over 60% in his first in double A in 2021. 2022, he gets that down to nearly 40%. It was a little over that. Amazing. Was getting the ball in the air more, was pulling more to tap into more power. He led that double A league in waiter runs creative plus by a wide margin. So he was by far the best hitter in that league. Gets called up AAA. There's an injury to, to Giorme um, in 2022. Ends up to, to the big league club to platoon with Eduardo Escobar. Then he gets hurt out for the year. Coming into this season, there was high expectations based on that great 2022 campaign. And also a really nice spring training. And then a torrid start in AAA where he forced the Mets hand. They had to promote him. He gets up and he actually performs well. That's the funny thing about it. He was solid in that first month of the season. He hit 333 in 10 games in April, had an 861 OPS, but then he started to struggle. And he ends up finishing the year with a 212 batting average, a 275 on base percentage, a 323 slugging percentage. His OPS was 598. Only hit nine home runs, had 12 doubles, and 108 games played around 400 plate appearances. Talk about WRC plus a lot. That's way to runs creative plus measuring hitters based on a league average of hundred. His WRC plus was 68, 32% worse than your league average hitter. He struck out more than he has since rookie ball. 28% of the time he walked more than he has in any stop, any stop in the minor leagues. Okay. He always had a walk rate of at least 11 and a half percent. And it was down to seven and a half. So not getting on base as much, not working the same amount of good at bats that he had previously. And that's of course in the minor leagues, it's an adjustment. We know that, but he went from a, a top prospect who thrived in the early part of the season to a guy that was still trying to keep his head above water when he got to uh, May and June. You know, he was like a 300 on base percentage guy with a 650 OPS. Not great, but kind of acceptable, right? For a guy who's you know, going through his first tour in the big leagues. And the thought was, all right, he'll normalize final couple months. Maybe he gets those, those stats up a bit. Maybe he can be a 700 OPS guy and he closes the year. Even if it wasn't going to be a spectacular rookie season, you could feel optimistic about him as your starting third base on an opening day in 2024. It just didn't happen. He struggled worse as the season wore on. He hit 188 in July and he didn't get a hit in August and 18 at bats before they had to send him a triple A. He thrived there, comes back up, and had a 536 OPS in September. Just wasn't good. 
He hit the ball on the ground this year 50.2% of the time. Now, again, when he's closer to 40%, he's more successful when he's getting the ball in the air, driving the baseball, getting those extra base hits, and also hitting some home runs. You're going to get way more value. And when it comes to home runs, his home run to fly ball rate was 13.4%. By far the lowest mark of his career at any stop. Had never been under 20% since his time in rookie ball. And here it was at 13.4%. So what that basically means is when he was hitting those fly balls, they just weren't leaving the yard. It's not enough juice there. So what happened? Was this simply a player that was asked to do too much? You know, he was called up and expected to help a veteran team that really started to struggle. And, you know, he it was, you know, the baby mats are going to save the season. It just was too much pressure on him. Was it just playing in these big ballparks with all these lights and you know having to deal with the travel for the first time in that manner, going to all these new cities and just trying to 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 make it work, feeling like a fish out of water? I think there was part of that certainly, and I'll get to a real stat that illustrates that in a bit here. But overall, it was just a brutal season for Brett Beatty, and that leads to a lot of questions moving forward because you have to wonder: Can he fix this? Is there some concrete? you know, things he can work on that can change what he just did. And and going to next season, he can build himself up to be able to handle those trials and tribulations of the big leagues and actually be able to start to find a little bit of success because, you know, it's crazy how that window you have to, to solidify yourself can shrink. It seemed like he was the clear guy. But now you have Ronnie Mauricio, who I wouldn't say lit the world on fire, but certainly looked a lot more comfortable in the big leagues in his short stint in September. And he might be best suited to play third base in the big leagues, especially when you have Luis and Helicuna and Jet Williams, who could be second baseman because they're both shortstops who aren't going to play that position with Lindor. Acuna, fairly close. I don't think it's at all uh, an outlandish thing to say he's going to be up next year. He's probably your future second baseman if they don't trade him. And Mauricio could play third. All of a sudden, Beatty's out of a job. So this is a pivotal offseason for Brett Beatty to get himself right. And the other thing, too, is defensively he wasn't great. Minus five defensive runs saved, minus four outs above average. His F war, which is wins above replacement, was in the negatives, negative 0.5. That is just not what any of us thought was going to happen this year. And I want to, in the next segment here, really explore what happened, get into some of the stats behind it and see where can he figure this thing out to improve and actually be able to find that success and potentially a big bounce back in 2024. We'll get to all that in a minute before we do. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. October baseball is back and you can make your postseason debut with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Join FanDuel today and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to create your new account. Now you can get in on the action from the first pitch until the final out. Better than everything from strikeouts to home runs to who will win the game. And if you don't want to wait the whole game to get a W, predict what will happen in the next at bat with quick bets. Look, we're about to see the Braves and the Phillies in this series where they're knotted up at one game apiece and it's tough to find a rooting interest. Hey, look at the pitching matchup. See who you think is best. And lay a wager and give yourself a dog in the fight because it's really good baseball to watch. I mean, it sucks the Mets aren't in it, but this is the time of year where baseball is at its best. And by going and playing with FanDuel, you can make a little bit more out of the moment. Head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on right now. Step up to the plate this postseason with $200 and bonus bets guaranteed. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Why was Brett Beatty so awful this season? What happened? How did he go from this top prospect who seemed can't miss to a guy that couldn't hit a breaking ball? Well, that was a big part of it. He got eaten alive by breaking balls this year. Whiff percentage against sliders was 45%. His whiff percentage across the board on breaking balls was 45%. So that basically means when he swung at the pitch, nearly half the time he was swinging through a breaking ball. Against curveballs, it was 42%. Sweepers, 47.8%. Slurves, 66.7%. That was the whiff percentage. Strikeout percentage, 
on sliders, 47.6%, 46.9% on curveballs, 43.8% against sweepers. Strikeout percentages, you know, those at bats that they're trying to put you away, how often are you striking out? So, again, dangerously close to 50% of the time. Now, he hit pretty well against splitters and sinkers. Was bad overall against fastballs, but if you look at the expected batting average of 281 and the expected slug of 480, along with a hard hit percentage of 47.8%, he was still hitting the ball hard against fastballs. And I think the results weren't there. And part of that comes with some bad luck. Part of it comes with, you know, just when you're struggling, when you do hit the ball hard, it's, it's finding gloves, right? So again, that ties into bad luck, but also just ties into, you know, an overall struggle, right? Where you just can't get anything to go your way. I still believe he's going to be able to hit velocity. I, I don't think there's any question about that. But you look at the net result of all of it. There is something called run value, right? This is what a batter brings to the table based on the outcomes. It is as specific as that. If Brett Beatty comes up in a big spot with two runners on, he hits a home run, that is going to up his run value. If in that same spot he strikes out, that's going to hurt the Mets. And that is you know, credited, debited from his run value throughout a season. So his batting run value, which in the simplest terms is sort of you know, his spot in the lineup. How much value was he adding to, to the Mets? His batting run value was minus 17 this year. That was in the fourth percentile in Major League Baseball. So in a sense, he cost your team 17 runs compared to a, a league average player. It's one of the worst hitters in baseball. His whiff percentage, strikeout percentage, and expected WOBA, which is expected weighted on base average. It's another stat that you know, is an all-encompassing metric that tries to you know put a number on a hitter's value. The bottom line is between that stat, the whiff percentage, the strikeout percentage, all of them were in the body, bottom 20% of the league. Now, since I just mentioned the run value, I actually want to take a second to look up Francisco Lindor's because, again, this will give you a sense of what that means. Okay, so Francisco Lindor, I'm pulling up his baseball savant right now, which is where you can find all this information. Um, let's see. The browser's taking a second. All right. Lindor, this year, we know, great season, 31 home runs. His batting run value was in the 78th percentile. He was plus 14. So his spot in the lineup, eventually, he added 14 runs of value to the New York Mets with his bat compared to Beatty at minus 17. So th that's the swing, right? If you had you know, another Lindor at third base, that's a 31-run swing on your season total. It's drastic, clearly. But that's the point, right? This could have been a, a way different season if Brett Beatty was what he was supposed to be. Now, going through the numbers a little bit again, how did he get there? What was the struggle outside of just the breaking pitches? You look at his swing take profile. Okay, This is assigning that run value to each region of the plate. So there's the heart region, which I think kind of explains itself. That's where hitters should be thriving, pitches over the heart of the zone. There's the shadow region. So those are the pitches that are on the edges of the strike zone to just outside the strike zone. There's the chase region, which is the area outside that. Then there's the waste region pitches that are way out of the zone. Now, you look at his plate discipline. Brett Beatty was good in the chase and waste zones. He was plus seven on his run value in the chase zone, plus five in the waste zone. He was minus 16 over the heart of the plate, and minus 13 in the shadow region. So pitches that he could hit struggled. It wasn't, hey, I'm just chasing way out of the zone. He's not Javi Baez. He was still identifying things. It's not like his eyes suddenly deceived him. It's just the difference between, you know, playing baseball in the minor leagues is those guys in the minors, they can't locate their breaking balls at the bottom of the zone with that precision. So you can identify a breaking ball and know which ones to spit on or the ones that are strikes, they're a little bit more up in the zone. If you look at where Beatty was able to find success, you know, pitches that were, you know, a little bit up in the zone, a little more towards the belt region. Like he was able to, to do some damage, right? He was able to, to put the ball in play and have some success when it got to the absolute bottom of the strike zone, he, he could do nothing with it. And the same goes with the fastballs up in the zone. Again, pitchers in the majors are located and the minors 
you know, the pitchers, you know, trying to hit up in the zone. Sometimes they're just missing out of the zone. Easy to spit on. That's how you get your walks or they miss and you're ambushing them and you're doing damage. And so when you get to that point where, you know, they're throwing sliders that are in the bottom of the zone that you either have to look at and you're going to strike out or you try to swing and you hope you can at least foul them off. But most of the time you're swinging through it and striking out. It's just a frustrating season. And then when you get into your head and all that's happening, those fastballs that you're supposed to be doing damage on, you're not finding the gap with it. You might hit it hard, but you hit it right to the first baseman. You, know, you pull it hard on the ground right over there. And it's just a snowball effect. Here's the one statistic I found that gives me a breath of optimism for Brett Beatty next season. And it's a little bit handpicked, but it's actually a sample size that is a little bit representative of who he could be when you remove some of these other factors. So Brett Beatty, when facing right-handed pitching at home, he hit 262, 331 on base, 452 slug, had a 117 WRC plus. He was 17% better than your league average hitter. That was 48 games, 141 plate appearances. That's a representative sample. Now on the road, he was terrible. He hit 184, 251 on base, 227 slug, 478 OPS, 33 WRC plus. He was, what is that, 67% uh, worse than your league average hitter? Just horrible. And wasn't great against lefties at home either. But when you had him facing right-handed pitching in a ballpark he was comfortable in, He was able to thrive. So when you go into year two and you're more comfortable playing on the road, you're more comfortable in your skin as a ball player, you are used to being in the big leagues. Maybe what he was able to find at home against right-handed pitching, he can find across the board. We'll see how he fares against lefties next year. There's every chance that, you know, maybe he is in a platoon situation. But if he was able to go out next year hit 262 with a 330 on base percentage and a 452 slug and that's a 780 and change OPS you would take that to the bank if you could say a 117 WRC plus going to be 17% better than your league average hitter in year two sign me up i obviously you want him to be better than that down in the future but that would at least give you hope that okay he can be your starting third baseman so the question is can he get there? You know, what does he have to do to improve? I think we've already gotten into that. It's finding a way to waste those pitches, the, the tough breaking balls, waste them staying at bats, waste the, the the high fastballs, get a bat on it at least, or you know, potentially even learn how to hit those pitches, but at least do that. And then when he gets the pitches that he can really handle to do his damage on them. And, and I think with a, a, an off season where he really works on, on things, He can get there. I don't think that this is a lost cause, particularly when you see what other players have done going from year one to year two this past season. I want to explain that a little bit before we do. Today's episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. Modern medical care and treatment are important, but our global supply chains are fragile. Things like pandemics, natural disasters, and foreign travel may cut you off from the treatment you need. Jace Medical is your solution. Just fill out their online forms and one of their board-certified physicians will review it to determine whether medications are safe and appropriate. Then, they send your prescriptions to one of their partner pharmacies where your Jace order will be filled and mailed directly to your home. Not only this, you can send your physician a message for answers to treatment-related questions anytime. Everyone should be empowered to care for themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected. That's why Jace Medical offers the Jace case. Save more than $360 by getting these life-saving antibiotics with Jace Medical, plus an additional $20 off by using the code locked on at checkout on jacemedical.com. That's Jace, J A S E, medical.com. Can Brett Beatty bounce back in year two? There was a lot of guys this year that were able to find success in their second season. We're just going to look specifically at OPS jumps, guys that were rookies in 2022 that had a breakout in year two. Bobby Witt Jr. of the Royals became a superstar this year. Went from a 722 OPS to an 813 OPS. Stole a ton of bases, hit a bunch of home runs. Was awesome. Bryson Stott, 653 
OPS to 747. Was he an all-star? No, but was he a damn good second baseman all around? Yes, he was. And now he's thriving in the postseason with the Phillies. Jose Siri, 607 OPS, all the way up to 761. Got over 20 home runs this year. Riley Green, 682 OPS to a 796 OPS. Spencer Torkelson, 604 OPS to a 758 OPS. Ezekiel Duran, 643 OPS to a 768 OPS. And Nolan Gorman, 721 OPS to an 805 OPS. All of those guys experienced massive jumps in OPS in year two. Why? They were more comfortable in the big leagues. And I think Brett Beatty has that opportunity now to really look under the hood at what went wrong, assess it, work really hard this offseason, go back and prove himself. Because, look, he had to do that in 2021 to 2022. Not that he was bad in double A, but he certainly wasn't the same player that he was in high A. And you want to see when players make that jump that they can stabilize, that they, no matter who they're facing, can find their success. He had things to work on. He came back. He handled them with, with you know, exactly the, the type of attention to detail that you want. And he got himself to a point where he was really successful. This year, we thought he did the same as far as the defense. And in some respects, he wasn't horrible. And I do think eventually he carried his bat into the field because early on, I thought he looked pretty good at third base. And down the stretch, I, I thought he had his moments. So that was an area of improvement. I think this is a guy that works hard and will get there. And an interesting comp that I wanted to look back on is Austin Riley. Now, Austin Riley is a guy that can win an MVP one day. I don't know if Brett Beatty's there. But just simply looking back to what he was and where he's now gotten to. 2019 is rookie season. He hit 226, 279 on base. So not great. Now, he did hit 18 home runs in 80 games. So that was really impressive. He had a 471 slugging percentage. Way better than Brett Beatty's rookie year, but still a struggle. And then he was bad in 2020 as well. 2021, his first half, he still wasn't great. But then he exploded in the second half, helped the Braves win a World Series, and has been great ever since. Now, you could pretty much pencil him in for at least 35 home runs and 90 runs driven in. And a lot of times, he gets closer to 100 runs driven in. I mean, an unbelievable player all around. Just has got himself to a different level. He hits over 270 every year, and he had one season where he hit over 300 while playing solid defense at third. Brett Beatty, I think, can be uh, a facsimile of that. Is he going to hit the 35 home runs ever? I don't know. But could he hit 30 in a season and consistently live in the 20 to 25 range? That, I think, can happen. Can he hit for a much higher average? I believe so. I think he's a guy that, at his best, could flirt with 300 at the big league level. He's a guy that can get on base over a 350 clip and have that slug up. So maybe he is an 800 OPS guy while playing solid defense at third base. I still believe in Brett Beatty as the third baseman of the future. I'm not going to look at one down year with all of the circumstances surrounding him and throw out the years of analysis comparing him to a Ronnie Mauricio and suddenly say, hey, because Ronnie looked a little more comfortable in his skin down the stretch in September, he's definitely the third base in the future. I don't know. One of them could be. And for all we know, maybe it's, I don't know. I, I don't know how they would align it, but you have Jet Williams, you have Luis and Helicuna. Maybe it's one of those infielders that has to be moved over down the line. Maybe Jet, I don't know. I think you'd like to speed up the middle, but that's a conversation for another day. I think the Mets, as a franchise, were really counting on Brett Beatty. Um, I think you know, the ideal scenario was that you know, Brett Beatty was your third baseman and Francisco Alvarez is going to be your catcher, and that was what you really felt strongly about. There was always questions about Mark Vientos. And, you know, could he be to your DH? You know, is he going to hit enough? How is he going to find a role with Pete Alonso on the team when first base is his real position? It, it, there was a lot of, of doubt. Ronnie Mauricio, for the longest time, I was doing podcasts about why the Mets should trade him. He was a top prospect. Now he's up, and you don't know what position he's going to play or what he's going to do, but there was never that expectation that he was going to grab 
second base or third base and hold it down for a decade. Beatty had that. And even though this season went as bad as it possibly could, I can't just say right now, yep, he's a bust. Trade him, get rid of him. Not worth anything. Get something of value while you still can before he continues to stink up the joint in 2024. I think you're going to see a much better version of Brett Beatty this year. Um, well, in 2024. Um, I don't think he's going to necessarily reach his ceiling, and I think you'd hope he wouldn't because you'd hope he continued to improve over time. But I think next year he's going to be a guy that's going to figure it out to the point where you look moving forward and say, yeah, that's our third baseman, and we're going to figure out the rest of our infield around that left side of Beatty and Lindor. That's still my hope. But, hey, you never know what can happen. Anyway, that's going to be all for today's edition of Locked on Mets. For all you everydayers on tomorrow's show, I'll be breaking down Francisco Alvarez's rookie season. Obviously far more successful than Beatty's, but a season with a lot of peaks and values. So, so we'll talk about that up and down year that he had and you know what to expect from Alvarez moving forward. It'll be a fun show. Speaking of fun, join our subtext. The link is in the description of today's episode. This is a way where you can get text updates from me about the show, about the Mets, everything going on. You can also text me as well. So I've been answering any questions that you all have, and it's been great to get to know some of the everyday listeners a little bit better through this new platform. It's a two-week free trial, then $4.99 a month. I do appreciate everyone who finds that link in the description and joins. Um, anyway, though, that's going to be all for the show. Make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. Follow me on Twitter, Stein Ryan, and follow the show, Locked On Mets.